title of the session is Preventing Mining Related Illness in Workers and the Community. And I, I'm your chair. My name is Denny Dobbin. I'm a fellow of the Collegium. Uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce our panel to you. Uh, our first speaker is going to combine two talks. We've, we've had to rearrange things a little bit because uh, Dr. Von Lindgren is unable to join us. So uh, we're going to combine things a little bit and start with uh, Susan to uh, give uh, the first two sessions, Exposure Assessment and Risks of Management in Mining Communities, and then she'll transition right into uh, integrated uh, public health, community of advocacy, and remediation of legacy contamination from mining and smelting. And then we'll move on in the agenda for from there. <clears throat> and I, I might say about the uh, agenda that you can scratch off the last two sessions it, there's a typo in the uh, uh, the uh, uh, program, and, and those got duplicated. So we really only have uh, four speakers in uh, in this session. So uh, first, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Susan uh, Spallinger. Uh, Susan's. Uh, Environmental scientist with about 17 years of experience. She specialized in metal contamination, risks and exposure assessment, soil and dust sampling, data analysis, data management, quality assurance. She's uh, uh, a principal owner, uh, a principal and a co owner of Terra Graphics Engineering, Environmental Engineering. It's an Idaho based firm that uh, maintains a small, strong commitment to improving the environment the communities in which they work. And, uh, Here's Susan. Thank you. It's an honor to be here today to present this work. Uh, the purpose of this talk is to really promote the use of exposure assessment and risk management as a method to characterize environmental contamination and its impact on the residents of communities and their health. <coughs> the first few slides are just a little bit of a background on exposure assessment. It is a component of a larger process called risk assessment. In the US, risk assessment is a framework or a process that we use to help make decisions about environmental conditions at sites. The purpose of it is to protect public health and the environment. And one of the goals is to prevent exposures, to prevent people from being harmed from environmental contamination in hopes that we don't see people being sick. We want to take action before that happens. In the risk assessment process, there are four main components. One of them being to identify hazards at a site. The next is how toxic are those hazards. And then the focus today is on exposure assessment. Who is exposed, how much, how often. And of course, in the end, we look at the magnitude of the risk and the probability of causing harm at a site. Exposure assessment really needs to involve the community. We look at who, who's exposed, how they're exposed, why they're exposed. It's appropriate to develop a conceptual site model. What this does is helps evaluate exposures. It looks at sources of contamination, such as a tailings pile or, or waste material, how that's transported into the environment, and how people are exposed, the different pathways and routes. The conceptual site models are a key component to helping to evaluate uh, what's happening at a site. So the key is understanding the community. There, are cult there could be cultural or religious practices that might expose people to certain um, parts of the environment. Socioeconomics are a major consideration. Are there alternative industries or ways to make a living in the community? So of course, culture, demographics, and economics are important. All of this comes together in what we call risk management where we take the outcome of the risk assessment process and combine it with many factors so that the leaders and, and regulators can reduce or manage risk at a site. So today I'd like to talk about how we applied this at one of the large Superfund sites in the United States. It's called the Bunker Hill site 
and it is uh, located in northern Idaho. It is a large mining site. Mining began in the late 1800s there, and smelting of the heavy metals came soon thereafter. I'm going <clears> to... <throat> I'm going to hone in on a particular area of the site facing west. There are more than 15 communities in this area of Bunker Hill and over 7,000 people that live in these communities. This is to give you a little idea of the setting at the site in northern Idaho. It's a mountainous region and the communities are in the valley. There's a river that runs through it west to the lake. The most of the people live in the valley floor. Much of the mining that began occurred uh, throughout the area. There are mine sites and, and waste piles throughout the, the gulches and, and mountains there. The smelter came, and of course, all of this um, has occurred right there near where most of the uh, residents live. The Bunker Hill Company was one of the largest. The mining in the area produced almost a third of the nation's lead, half of the silver, and about a quarter of the zinc. And by the early to mid-1900s, it was Idaho's, the state of Idaho's largest employer. The environmental practices changed over the decades, of course, when various environmental regulations were adopted in the United States. For example, this is showing Tailings, sludge, waste impoundment, right here near the school and the community. One of the tragedies, tra tragedies of the Bunker Hill story is the childhood lead poisoning epidemic that occurred in 1973. The price of metals was high. A fire took out the air pollution control equipment at the smelter. And the owners of the company, knowing that lead was poisoning children, decided to continue to operate the smelter in order to continue to make money. So in 1974, blood lead levels, the biological monitor of uh, exposure to lead, was evaluated. And for those children living closest to the smelter, their lead levels, on average, were about 70 micrograms of lead per deciliter of blood. So environmental sampling and the risk assessment process began at the site, and the exposure routes as shown in this conceptual model were evaluated. Child's exposure to lead and arsenic and other metals in the area uh, was mainly coming through the air pathway. They were eating, breathing, uh, uh, the metals at their home, of course, in the schools and playgrounds as well. By 1981, the smelter ceased operations, and the air pathway was no longer as critical as the other pathways. Over that time, a database was compiled, and as the data were evaluated, it indicated that the most influence on blood lead levels were the air lead levels the yard soil concentrations at that child's home, the amount of dust in the home, as well as the child's age and the father's occupation. And I believe as Carol pointed out early, earlier today, occupation is an important pathway where some of the miners, some of the smelter workers would be at work and they would bring the dust home, the contaminated dust to the house and become entrained in the house dust. <clears throat> Surveys of the families were also ongoing, and important exposure factors were identified in this analysis. Poverty levels, uh, grass cover of the yard were important factors. Of course, the use of locally grown produce as well. By using these data, the local health officials were able to develop a community-specific lead health intervention program with the objective to minimize lead absorption in children while source control actions were underway. This, this program in the early stages was jointly funded by both the mining companies and the, the state and local governments. So the first try at intervention 
was met with low participation rates. <clears throat> By 1985, aggressive door-to-door -door solicitation occurred. And by 1988, it was decided to pay the families for having their children come get their blood lead tested. This dramatically, both of those methods dramatically increased participation in the intervention program. And although the mining companies are no longer around to help pay for this program, the lead health intervention program continues today. This is all occurring simultaneously with source control efforts. As I said, by 1981, the smelter had closed and the industrial complex was demolished into a high-level waste repository. Fugitive dust sources were eliminated. This image is from the same bridge. If you remember the tailings impoundment, that's coming off of that tailings and waste impoundment. And after that, tailings and waste impoundment was capped. The amount of dust coming off of it was much lower. Common areas, schools, playgrounds where children were playing were cleaned up. The dirty soil was removed and clean soil was, was put in its place. Water was treated. Revegetation and restoration of the barren hillsides occurred, or was attempted. <clears throat> and of course, one of the largest components of, this pro of source control was to go door to door to each property uh, in, the, in that valley and clean it up. So if its soil lead levels were above the risk-based action levels, each property was cleaned up where up to 30 centimeters of soil were removed and replaced with clean soil with the lawn and the vegetation replaced. Today, over 5,000 properties throughout this valley have been cleaned up and the cleanup is still ongoing. Of course, all of this was occurring in order to reduce children's blood lead levels. And the goal was to have 95% of all children with blood lead levels less than 10 micrograms per deciliter. Throughout all of this time, large databases have been accumulating and the, since the 1980s. And we further evaluated the exposure pathways at the site. Soil and dust, now that the, the smelters ceased operation, are the main exposure pathways to young children. They accidentally eat soil. And what we quantified here is that not only was the yard soil around the home important to affecting blood lead levels, it also impacted house dust. In addition, the neighborhood soils, so the homes, right near the child's house were also impacting house dust levels. And of course, community soil levels were also impacting house dust and childhood blood lead levels. So the point here is that the main exposures to children were from soil and dust. And by cleaning up the soil, our hope was to reduce the levels of lead in house dust and ultimately reduce the levels of lead in children's blood. We knew we were not going to stop children from eating dirt. They all do. They're young, they're in the house, they crawl on the floor, and their hands and their toys are in their mouth. So what we tried to do is remove the metals from the dirt and that dust in order to allow them to be eating clean dirt. So the whole idea was through source control and intervention to eliminate exposures and manage risk. And we've successfully seen this in children's blood lead levels over the years that have reached uh, very low levels, near 2 micrograms per deciliter, as Dr. Von Linder had pointed out earlier. And that is it for the first part of this talk. And I will continue into the next one here. I'm going to continue with the Bunker Hill site as an example, case study of integrated uh, public health and community involvement and the legacy of contamination that's left at mining sites. Community involvement has been one of the key aspects of this Bunker Hill site. In order for it to be successful and meaningful, clear expectations need to be laid out. It's important to earn trust and credibility 
and that only occurs through honest communication and open communication. And of course, by involving local leaders and community members, they not only need an opportunity to voice their opinions, but they need to be involved in the action. And at Bunker Hill, the cleanup theme was to uh, be done for, by, and with the community. The, this is an incredible example of how residents have been involved in this cleanup for over 30 years. And how was that done? As I indicated early on, house-to-house <clears throat> -house contact occurred. Many times the local residents were trained and they were the ones going door to door to discuss the project, the challenges, and help the families understand the environmental health problems. And this is how the intervention was accomplished, was by going door to door with, with local folks that are trained and knowledgeable in the area, directed by the local health officials that were also living in the area. This required trust, of course, to gain participation and how they did this was a successful integration of the community leaders forming a local task force that was involved with a lot of the decisions that the regulators were making. Residents were trained so that they were doing the work. They were taking jobs to help clean up the soil, as you can see here. They were also going door to door, as I mentioned earlier. And this continued to help inform and educate the communities. Many times when people would refuse to participate in the cleanup, if they saw their neighbors get a new lawn, they became jealous and would then participate in the program. So it was a good way to observe and see how training and having people living in the area be involved in what's going on help to continue to get the cleanup to occur. Over the years with, with the intervention program and the incentive, incentivi by the payment for children to come um, submit their blood lead sample, the result is high participation. We estimated that around 50% of all of the children living in the valley participated in the annual blood lead program which was, we felt, extremely high. In addition to the high numbers, the high turnout, data was also collected on why families were not participating. So this would help develop strategies and adapt the local health professionals' approach to how to provide information and educate folks. I want you to re remember that this was all about not only intervention and public outreach and education, but source control. This map here is a, uh, depicting one of the towns in the valley called Smelterville. And the red indicates extremely high lead levels. The blue and the green indicate much lower lead levels below risk-based action levels. This is early on in the cleanup where you can see that most of the town was extremely contaminated. And over the years as the cleanup occurred, it got cleaner and cleaner, of course. And all of this was done, as you recall, by a thin layer of clean soil throughout the community. But due to the limited resources of money, not all of the contamination was cleaned up. What was below that barrier was still the, contamin still the lead and arsenic contamination. So this leaves a legacy of contamination in that valley that the residents need to continue to maintain in order to eliminate and reduce exposures into the future. So for example, when development occurs and construction occurs and they dig deeper than those top 30 centimeters, you need to ensure that the contamination sitting under there is not being brought back into um, pa the exposure pathways of children. So the long-term protection to maintain the clean dirt is extremely important. And the community knowledge and involvement in this program will help continue to keep that going. As you can see in this photo, again, the red is identifying the higher levels of lead 
And the hillsides right around this town of Smelterville could not be cleaned up. They were attempted to be revegetated in order to reduce erosion. So again, the importance of ensuring that um, education, source control, and intervention continue so that recontamination does not occur. So in this Silver Valley, in the area where Bunker Hill is, there are still hillsides, as I showed you, that are contaminated. There are folks that will play and recreate along the rivers and the lakes that are still contain contaminated sediment. And of course, there's plenty of opportunity for hiking and recreation where they pick wild berries. All of this creates the potential for recontamination. And so what we don't want to occur is to have these activities continuously bringing lead and arsenic and heavy metals back into the home environment where it can be entrained and exposed to young children again. The way this is occurring is through the local health officials program uh, for institutional controls. This is to main, maintain uh, the integrity of these barriers and the source control and to continue the lead health intervention program. So in conclusion, I'd like to stress the importance of integrating the community and the public health officials in the cleanup and involving the industries and in understanding the economy. It provides for institutional knowledge in the communities, gives the good resource base. Ground level implementation is extremely important using the local regulators and, and government. The community Advocacy and involvement evolves over the course of, of a cleanup. And the important thing to always remember is to adapt to the local cultural and social economic conditions of the area. So with that, I'd like to go and end. Thank, Thank you. you. We take a question or two. Thanks, Peter Bingham from University of Vermont. Um, I'm aware that some mining companies, uh, maybe they're foreign, in Armenia have paid for uh, child care. And I'm interested that, I think you mentioned that the, the mining companies, uh, they've paid for child care organizations and centers. So I'm just interested that the mining company paid for some of the work. What motivated them? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. That was in the very early years of uh, after the smelter had operated without the air pollution control equipment and the, the childhood lead poisoning epidemic that occurred, uh, I believe resulted in them jointly funding the intervention program and the local health officials work. So they didn't actually uh, pay for child care, they were helping with the paying for the intervention program. There's another question here. Uh, any short look, Pat Metzikshat, Hedak Michoskov, Vorderer, Nas Garantianer, Voron Quorias in Chanogidem, America, Orenki, Erkida, Yavashkatezin, Arsak, Orenkner, Tevoch. Could we have your affiliation and name, please? So, so, Anistan, Ashkatanki, Yenay, Jaragaitai, Navatang, with San Bajnipet, Arochap of San Nakarazu. Thank you. And if I remember your question, the uh, involvement of the local community. Um, they were compensated. The jobs that they took to clean up the soil as well as go door to door as part of the local health officials intervention program, they were paid jobs and that money did come through some of the U.S. regulation called uh, the Comprehensive Environmental Response and Compensation and Liability Act which created a fund. So when the mining companies moved all of their money to outside the United States and declared bankruptcy, there was a fund available to help continue that cleanup work. And the 
the reason the community members wanted to, the, the, the incentive for them to be involved and to be part of that cleanup was so that in order to maybe sell their property, if it was cleaned up, it would be easier for them to sell. Um, so I hope, did that answer your question? Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity here today. Our next speaker is uh, Margaret, Dr. Margaret Von Braun. Dr. Von Braun is an environmental engineer. Uh, she uh, taught and conducted research at the University of Idaho for 30 years, where she helped found the uh, and directed the environmental science, environmental engineering program. And uh, for the last, uh, for about 10 years, I think she, uh, she was the, uh, she served as the dean of the College of Graduate Studies. Uh, she and her husband, uh, Dr. Ian von Lind Lindren, founded TerraGraphics in Environmental Engineering in 1984. And uh, since they're moving on to uh, new, new adventures, uh, they're co-founding uh, TerraGraphics International Foundation, which is a non-governmental organization to provide assistance to communities to reduce environmental exposures. Thank you very much. Thanks, I'm really happy to be here. I just wanted to add one more um, comment about the Bunker Hill site. Um, there were also, under our legal systems, opportunities for lawsuits against the company. So individuals were compensated legally for some of the damage that was done in the 70s. And as Susan mentioned, the Superfund program hired a lot of local people to do this. So these weren't volunteers locally, they were hired. Getting a wave here that they can't hear me. Is that okay? Well, um, I'm, I'm glad I'm following Susan for a number of reasons. First of all, she's, she's wonderful. I've worked with her for over 20 years. And what you just heard about, the Bunker Hill site, which is pretty much a traditional mining, smelting kind of facility. Slow down. OK. Um, is a model of remediation that we have now taken internationally. So the same concepts of community involvement, of persistence, of using high standards, of using clear remediation are ones that we are addressing and applying to sites around the world. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. As you may remember from earlier presentations, um, the United States is the leader in recycling of lead, um, but most of our primary smelters have closed. In fact, they've closed, and most of those industries have moved overseas, so much that the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, has really concluded that the lead pollution problem is finished. There's no more problem, which I find really horrible, because what we've really done is We've just given that problem to other countries to deal with. We've, we've sent it overseas. Um, and as we've also heard a few times today, China is now the leader in mining, in production, and in demand in use for lead, particularly in car batteries. So what I want to talk about is <clears throat> instead of looking at traditional sources of mining and metals, what are the new sources? Where is metal coming from now? Most of it isn't coming out of the ground. We still have mines, but we're also looking at existing sources of metals and mining them. So we're really kind of looking at old materials and reusing them. Um, I'm going to talk about three particular um, different kinds of, of these old wastes being revisited as new sources of metals. Um, we've heard a little bit about the smelter in Zambia. I'm going to talk about recycling of electronic waste or e-waste, as well as used batteries in different countries in the world. And then I'm going to spend most of my time talking about an um, artisanal mining site in Nigeria. 
And what I want to do with each of these sites is examine how we responded, how did the world respond, who responded, and what happened. So we'll begin with the site in Zambia. This was a site that was abandoned about 20 years ago. So it was an active smelter. Prices collapsed, and the smelter really was left in place. It was an abandoned, huge industrial facility for 20 years. And what happened was um, about 10,000 people lived in and around this facility and scavenged every piece of equipment at this facility for their livelihood. About 200 children died. There were some, some investigations, but people were li literally living in this industrial facility. Children were selling food there. Here's a picture of women essentially mining zinc in some of the waste material in the rubble. And the role of women at all of these sites I hope you'll see as a bit of a thread here. Young men scavenging for materials and selling it. They could make about eight or ten times as much as they could farming. So even though this was dangerous work and very hard work, it was lucrative. In response to the health and environment emergency, one of the first things that happened was the World Bank lent some money to a mining company to do remediation. And this was through the efforts of a variety of NGOs that convinced them to loan $15 million for the Copper Belt Environment Project, which had pretty typical lofty goals. They were going to make everything clean and everybody healthy. Um, one of the things they did was they dredged a very contaminated canal and as a result of that, forced 2,000 people to move, but didn't compensate them. So it really has not been, in my opinion, a very good cleanup. I visited this site um, about nine years ago. The city, which used to be a booming, economic, viable town, was deserted. And really, the only sign that I could see of anything to do with the environment was this sign that was written in rocks that said, keep the environment clean. That was it. I'm being a little facetious, but there wasn't nearly $15 million worth of effort that went into this cleanup. So last year, last year, a South African mining company and a Chinese mining company got together and decided in response to the high prices of metals, this is another theme you'll hear, that they were going to buy this whole facility. And they bought it. Now this facility is, is huge. I don't have a scale on here, but it's typical. It has mine tailings, it has smelter slag, it has refinery slimes. These are materials that were for 20 years considered waste, but now because of the price of metals, they are a resource. So these two companies got together and said, we're buying this, and we are going to build an appropriate processing plant, and we're going to concentrate the metals from all of this waste material. I always kind of laugh when I read the word appropriate, because I think, what does that mean? <laughs> appropriate to making money? <laughs> I think that's what it means. Um, if you look at some of the goals of this consortium, this African and this Chinese company, they say, first of all, that they are entirely insulated from any responsibility for legacy issues. So legally, they really don't own any of the liability for the waste. They own the product that can help make the money. This was something they negotiated with the Zambian government. But, of course, they intend to fully restore the environment and make everything wonderful. The president of this consortium says he is convinced that while they provide a return on their investment, they will clean up the environment. You would think that they formed this consortium only to clean up the environment when you read their publicity. 
But my questions are this. Are the environmental laws in Zambia such that they can ensure that this will really happen? The answer is pretty clearly no. Can the community, these are basically poor farmers and scavengers, can they organize? Do they have labor, labor organizations? Are the NGOs in Zambia very powerful? Can they ensure that this will actually happen? I don't think so. Is the financing transparent? It's very difficult to find out who actually benefits from this in the country, besides maybe a handful of politicians. Um, and most importantly, what would happen if the price of metals falls? Are they still going to clean up the environment? I suspect this facility may be abandoned for another 10 years. So this kind of operation is happening around the world. We're starting to find companies looking at waste materials and saying, hey, we can make money here. And if we negotiate this right, we won't have legal, legal liabilities. Maybe the people won't be able to organize in a way to make sure that we do things right. We'll make a lot of money and leave. And I doubt the Zambian government even required enough taxation that they will have much benefit. Another question is whether the companies will hire local labor. Chinese companies in much of the world bring in their own laborers from China, build villages in Africa with thousands of Chinese workers, and once the resource is extracted, they leave. So the local workers may really not get any benefit. And the role of the media in exposing this can also be limited. The next type of operation is looking at recycling, which is a huge source of metals, especially when prices are high. In China, a few years ago, I visited a very modern e-waste recycling facilities. They take appliances, old computers, copper wire, anything that has metal in it, and they recover the metal. This facility is so new and modern that when you visit it, you feel like a tourist. In fact, the signs are in English, and it is a tourist experience. You're seeing the best of the best. And it's a, it's a very good modern facility. It's very productive, it, it extracts, you can see in the bottom here, pure copper from all of the sources and other metals that they're recovering. But in China, like in much, much of the rest of the world, there is also an informal, sometimes illegal, sector of recycling. And in China, it's not only difficult to see, it's dangerous to see. I did see some, but I didn't take any pictures because it might have endangered those workers. But I did go to the Philippines, where you could slightly more easily see the informal sector. And this is an area near Manila. It's a, it's a giant slum where people are informally and illegally, but nobody really enforces it too much, mining e-waste. They are recycling. They are mining metals out of electronic waste. And in, during, during the nighttime, this street they would be piling up wire coated with plastic, copper wire coated with plastic. They would set fire to it, burn off all the plastic. And then during the day, you would see families stripping away and pulling the copper wire out of the remnant, remnants of this fire. Very dangerous, dirty work. Often children are employed in these kinds of operations. Um, the man here on the right is essentially dissecting electronic equipment and recovering everything precious from that equipment and recycling it and reusing it. So this is really how copper is mined in much of the world. It's not digging it out of the ground. It's digging it out of all of the stuff that we throw away. And children are often involved in scavenging anything that's valuable. We've heard a bit about batteries already. In the United States, about 
essentially almost all of the used car batteries are recovered, taken to secondary smelters, the lead is recovered and made into new batteries. But in, in many, many places in the world, there's again an informal, maybe illegal, sector where people are using hammers and axes to break open the battery. Here's some women on the right using hammers or breaking open the battery, and then they are smelting the lead, they're recovering the lead in an open fire with no protective equipment whatsoever. This is a very common scene around the world. And what they're doing, of course, is recovering the lead and, and trying to re retain a pure product. And we also find a lot of places where the plastic casing for the batteries are being used for housing or for furniture. In Senegal, uh, for many, many years, people recovered batteries like this, recovered lead from batteries, and made fishing weights. And when the price went up of lead in, in about 2007, women started recovering all of the waste lead that was left in this community. Tons and tons of waste lead was in the sand. And they started sifting it. And as a result of that activity, 18 children died from high lead exposure. The World Health Organization came in and responded, and there was a remediation of this site. In Russia, nuclear submarine batteries are recycled. And on the right here, you see where the battery casings are used for cisterns for gathering water for gardens. So what's the response been? NGOs respond, the World Health Organization responds, local governments respond. We build secondary smelters for batteries. That's the ideal. Um, there is a Basel Convention that says that used batteries are hazardous waste and we shouldn't ship them around the world. But sad to say, the United States never ratified it. Um, but these kind of products can be controlled. We can put a price tag on the battery so that when you bring the battery to an acceptable recycling facility, you get money back. So the solutions really aren't that difficult, um, technically. The last site I want to talk about is in Nigeria. Um, and there have been a number of, of organizations involved in this, in this cleanup. It's gone on now for three years. This is in a very extremely isolated part of Nigeria. It is not in the Gulf. It is not where the oil is. Nigeria is not a poor country. This is in Zamfara in the north, which is just south of the Sahara Desert. It's the Islamic northern part of Nigeria. The southern part is Christian. And that's important because Nigeria is a country with a lot of ethnic strife and, and is a dangerous place to work. And what happened here also has to do with the price of metals. In this case, it was the price of gold. And it was the combination of the high price of gold so high that it was worth it for people to go into old lead mines to extract gold. And this was often done using the labor force of women, because this is a Sharia law state where women are confined to their households and very limited in terms of the kind of work they can do. So here's the price of gold climbing, all kinds of activities. People can make 10 times as much money mining gold as they can farming. So they are looking for gold in old lead mines. And when this was first reported, all of the geologists in the world said, that's impossible. There isn't enough gold in a lead mine to make it worth it. This is a pretty unusual geologic formation. But these were ancient lead mines, and they do have enough gold in it to be worth it to this community. And you can see that the gold extraction is quite primitive. They used the grinders that they used for their food to also crush the rock. So there was also gross food contamination. And as a result, there was an epidemic of lead poisoning. At least 400 children died, most of them under the age of five. The blood lead levels, for those of you that are familiar with blood lead levels, look at these numbers. They are completely unprecedented. There were children with levels over 600, 600 micrograms per deciliter, the standard is 10, who survived. And when most of us studied the toxicology of blood lead, we were taught, you know, over 100, you're probably not going to live. The average here was well into the hundreds. Every child that was tested, every adult that was tested, was clinically lead poisoned. And 
this is a picture of one of the villages, the cemetery of the, of the children, where half of the children under age five died. And the village chief asked us to always show this picture <laughs> to help us remember. As Susan pointed out, all kids eat dirt. In the US, they eat an average of 100 milligrams of dirt per day. In this part of Nigeria, they probably ingest 10 times that amount because they are surrounded and living in a dirt environment. So the response included, again, NGOs, UNICEF, and governments. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Just want to show you a little bit about how the cleanup worked. Like at all sites, we did characterization. We removed the contaminated soil. We did household interiors. We brought back clean soil. We trained the local workers. We provided health and safety equipment. Here they're bringing back clean soil testing it to make sure it meets the levels, and doing this for eight villages using a pretty sophisticated GIS database to keep track of all of the lead levels, the blood lead levels, the soil levels, and the cleanup. Doctors Without Borders, Medicine Sans Frontier has done an incredible job of treating the children with chelation. Some of these children have been chelated for close to a year because their lead levels are so high. So it's an unprecedented amount of lead chelation. And it will take probably many, many years for the children to get blood lead levels down to anything we would consider close to acceptable. Right now, getting a blood lead level down to 50 micrograms per deciliter is considered a success in Nigeria. Health and safety includes hygiene. It includes bringing in masks. It includes providing kitchen facilities, safe food, and a lot about community messaging, which is particularly difficult in an area where there are no schools, there are no newspapers. Men and women live in society a segregated life. They are only together in their households. So when you communicate with women, you communicate with men separately. So it makes health messaging and community action and health education extremely difficult. The government's solution was simply to say, well, let's just ban mining. These people brought it on themselves. They just shouldn't be allowed to do this. And we said, no, that won't work. Because if you do that, first of all, it will undermine the cleanup. Nobody will participate in the cleanup. They will see it as a threat to their ability to make a living. And it will drive all of the mining activity underground, and nobody will be able to take care of any of the health effects. What we did is we've trained the miners to really be the remediation workers. So they're learning how to deal with metals safely, because we know they're going to end up being miners. And there have been many successes. One of my favorite successes is that they're always stealing the masks. So we're always bringing in more masks. We're happy to have people steal the masks, because we know they're using them to protect themselves and providing safe places for their children to play and to eat. This, is, this cleanup in Nigeria is costing up to $3 million. And this has been appropriated money primarily by the Nigerian government. Um, Nigeria has quite a reputation as a government. And for them to spend money to clean up their environment has been nothing short of a miracle. The media has played a huge role in making sure that would work. There's been incredible publicity about this site by news agencies all over the world. So here's my conclusions, my lessons learned. When metal prices go up, people resort to all kinds of things to extract metals. And the biggest impacts are on poor people and children. We know how to solve these problems. We know what the protocols are. We know how to clean up waste sites. But pollution and poverty are always together. And if we can address pollution and poverty, we can address many of the other problems that are part of being poor. It's incredibly important to make this work locally. You have to hire and involve the local people to do it and identify the local leaders. This is not the magic of outside people, outside experts, and outside money. That's a short-term solution. The real value is investing in the local people. We respond to emergencies, but what about prevention, education, laws, the media, experts, data, standards? Um, it really requires networks of all of those groups to work together. 
And if we do that, we can empower local leaders to take care of their own communities with their own resources. And this gives me great hope for the future because it is really their future and it is our future. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, for a poignant presentation. Do we have a question here? And could you identify yourself and uh, your affiliation? Jenna Vassartian, Genesian Memorial Foundation. Yes, I have charter Gitakan Hamasan itsem. Yes, Hetakir Kirer, Im Hamashat presentation. Carnivore, Im Nayev Magistrosa Kantesitema and Eco Caravarum ne Corporative. Yes, Hetakir Kirer, or yes, and Snor Nakatezi, or Menk. It depends on the levels of the metals in the soil and which metals there are. So first you must have a good characterization to know what vegetation can survive. In terms of removing those metals, you would have to dispose of them in a landfill. Because remember, metals are part of the periodic chart of planet Earth. They, you can't do anything but move them. to try to get them away from where people can be exposed to them. But once you do that, if you can remove those waste piles and bury them, then certainly you can restore the environment. And I'll be happy to discuss it more with you. We can. I just think that the question leads to our next presentation very smoothly. Ecologon also rain at Azotuneri Kentron, Tepanosian Gevork. Nah, me poker of a Latsumanem, take up on um, take Hajaran, Mirakanatsel and Line at Saval Heta Zotuner, Yever Charstum Comparze Darcel, Vor, Barbera Bar, Achtotman Hetevankov, Zaner Metagner, Hassel and Minchevson and Dain Shaktaner. I think on the Magistrosa Cantesi Hamaras and Vor, I stay a Hantir Petkeder Vinayev. Zaratun Kitseto, Anachapatumitseto, Vera has Gelvor, Pesi, Ait Taratskum, Terichunen, Asenk, Anasuneri Aratsatum, you have inch for Ker, Metagner, Chinknen, Zananda in Shachtaner. Yev Im Hartsov was says, Hantrumem Asel, Carnivor Zerner Katsvats Yerker Nerum. Banak Chitsan, Himnakan, Michotzer Handisanum, I Kapari, Yev Ail Zaner Metagneri Korzuma, Yev Vera Bacharuma. Patsin ran its work took Matakaralekam, Sovorats, Relekneran, Ispeskarelia, Pashpanvel, Nuinish Chenchin, Michos Nero. I'll Sanandi, Kam, Pori, Achpur, Vora Kapchunena, Hankartsuna, Berutsan had took Neran Stavelek, Tevoch. In many communities, um, that, that is the goal is to find alternative, safer 
ways of doing employment. So it really depends on the community. But I think it would be naive for us to assume that people don't continue to do mining in many of these communities. So our, our long-term goal is to make sure people can do that mining in a safe way. But in Senegal, for example, there were some NGOs that tried to find other sources of employment for the women that had been involved in that. So that's certainly part of the solution. Thank you very much. And also, Susan, maybe you could add about Bunker Hill that they created a completely different uh, economy there. Yes, at the Bunker Hill site, tourism and recreation became a large part uh, of the economy well, before the economic uh, turn, uh, downturn recently, but um, skiing and bicycling um, became some attractions for folks to come and visit the area and, uh, and visit the site and basically spend their money on hotels and restaurants and bicycle rentals. Thank you. Thank you, and we better move on. Um, I, I'm remiss in not uh, mentioning that Dr. Von Braun is also a fellow of the Collegium Ramazzini. Uh, and uh, demonstrates that it, uh, there are more, that, that it's not just white old men that are members <coughs> with gray, white hair. <coughs> uh, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Raina Mayer. Uh, Dr. Mayer serves as the director of the University of Arizona NIEHS, that's the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Superfund Research Program. I believe she's the uh, PEI, that's the principal investigator on a major research grant with the, uh, the National Institute. Uh, she is also the director of the University of Arizona Center for Environmentally Sustainable Mining. Uh, Dr. Mayer is, was named a leading uh, edge researcher at the University of Arizona, and she was a keynote speaker at the Penn State University Environmental Chemistry and Microbiology Symposium. She has degrees in biology, chemistry, and a PhD from my, in my microbiology, and has done postdoc work at, uh, in, my, in biochemistry. And uh, I leave you, I present you with uh, Dr. Mayer. Mayer. Thank you very much. And thank you so much to the uh, organizing committee for inviting me. Um, this is a trip of a lifetime. I don't think I would have ever uh, thought of coming to Armenia, but it's a, it's a beautiful place. And it's, it's my fortune. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the use of plants in remediation of mining wastes and some of the issues that need to be thought about um, as you are remediating the waste. Uh, but, but before I get into that, I would like to um, talk a little bit about what the Superfund Research Program is. That's the program that's funded the work that I'm going to tell you about. And my fortune in being here is Dr. Bill Sook's misfortune. Um, he was supposed to come. But because of our government sequestration, he was not allowed to come. And so I was fortunate enough to come in his place. He is the director of the NIEHS Superfund Research Program. And it is a university-driven program. In other words, the agency funds universities to acquire uh, knowledge about um, hazardous waste sites and how you can protect human health uh, from the hazards at those sites. Part of the program is to develop innovative technologies to prevent exposures from such sites. Part of the mission of the program is to train the next generation of scientists. And finally, part of our mission is to translate the results of our research into applied research that can be given to 
our federal regulators, our state regulators, and consulting firms so that they can actually implement this research to clean up uh, sites and to prevent uh, human exposures. This is a, a map of the United States and all of the little purple stars on the maps, on this map, like here, 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 are Superfund research programs. So there are currently about 17 different Superfund research programs in the United States. This is the University of Arizona Superfund research program where I come from. And this is the site, the Superfund site that we work at, the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter site that I'll be talking about today. I'd also like to mention the Institute for Mineral Resources, which is at the University of Arizona, and the director is Dr. Mary Poulton. The uh, mission for the Institute for Mineral Resources is to bridge basic and applied research in science, social science, engineering, health, business, leadership, policy, to work with leaders to adopt new ideas, policies, and technologies. And that is from soup to nuts in mining, um, finding new ores, finding new ore deposits, the best way to mine those ore deposits. How do you, how do you um, prevent uh, contamination from occurring? How do you protect human health? How do you get communities involved? All of those things are aspects of the Institute for Mineral Resources. And I've given, I've given the website here in case any of you are interested. And I have some brochures here in case any of you are interested. So the Center for Environmentally Sustainable Mining is a partnership between the Superfund Research Program and the Mineral Institute. So together, we're working to form this Center for Environmentally Sustainable Mining, um, whose mission is to work between academia and industry to develop innovation, innovative solutions and education programs um, to address environmental and human and ecosystem exposure issues that arise in the mining industry. And so our focal, our current focal areas are on dust characterization, dust control, remediation of mining waste, control of groundwater contamination, the fate and speciation of metals in mining waste, and finally, education and analysis. Um, some examples of things we do. Um, Garden Roots is a citizen science program that we implemented at the Iron King site that I'll talk about. This is where we went into the community because they were concerned about eating vegetables from their home gardens. And so we looked at metal uptake into home garden vegetables and we were able to report back to each home what their results were for the vegetables that they grew in their gardens. We develop informational materials um, for the general public. I have one here, what are mine tailings? We translate in English and Spanish and we can work with you to translate into Armenian as well. What is phytoremediation? Um, what is arsenic? We have also what is lead. We do health worker trainings. This is going into to, um, the community and finding health workers and training them to deal with specific contamination issues so that they can bring that information back to their community. And finally, we do analysis. Uh, mining is very water use intensive. Mining is also very energy intensive. Depending on where you are in the world, you need, to, you need to optimize the use of water and energy. In Arizona, we're in the desert. So we have to, we have to be very careful about our water use. So now let me move into uh, the, the science of my talk. 
um, we're very interested in um, preventing mining waste contamination from spreading off-site. So to do that, we have to understand what mining wastes are. So who here has gone to a mining site? Several of you have. So have you ever held any mine tailings in your hands? Um, the, the consistency is maybe like sand, maybe like flour, right? But if any of you have ever gardened, you pick up some soil and it has a rich earthy smell and you can, you can squeeze it through your hands and there's clods and peds and it has a structure to it. Mine tailings have none of these things. Um, they have no soil structure. They have a very impacted microbial community, and that means there's no normal cycling of carbon and nitrogen, for example. Um, some of these mine, mining sites have very low pH, are very acidic. Some of these mining sites have very high metal content. Those sites generally are legacy mine, mine sites, those that have been mined um, decades ago and just left. Modern mine practices do a better job at, re at removing all of the metals. And often, modern mine tailings have a neutral pH. But all soil structure is removed, and the microbial community is highly impacted. And as a result, you have very little vegetation that will, is able to grow on these sites. So what happens? Um, if you have a mine tailings site on a windy day, this is what happens. If you have a big rainfall event, this is what happens. This is, this is all water erosion of these tailings into a nearby <coughs> creek. Here are uh, children playing in a little stream down, downstream from some mine tailings, very, very high in arsenic. So all of this leads to human exposure via ingestion and inhalation, um, as, was, as was just uh, talked about very eloquently in the last couple of talks. So and here's, here's one more great slide. This is, this is in Mexico. And you can see they build the community, the village, right up against these mine tailings. This is on a beautiful still day like it is today here. And this is on a windy day, the same tailings from a different, different aspect. And you can, see, you can see the dust blowing over the village. These are 6% lead, these tailings. So my case study is the Iron King Mine Humboldt Smelter uh, site. It was listed as a Superfund site by the Environmental Protection Agency in 2008. Um, as I said, it's, it's in the state of Arizona. This is the, the front face of the tailings, and you can see all the water erosion rills. Um, and this is, a, this is a aerial view of the tailings right here, and this is the town of Dewey Humboldt, about 3,000 people. Problem, arsenic and lead up to 4,000 milligrams per kilogram, very acidic, completely barren of plants, and subject to wind and water erosion. You'll see some pictures in a minute. So what we are trying to do on these tailings is to establish a vegetative cap that is self-sustaining. And we are trying to plant directly into the tailings. Um, often you can you can put a soil cap that's about a foot deep and then plant into that. Um, but but um, it's very expensive to bring in that material. And so we wanted to ask the question, could we plant directly into the tailings? And if, if we did, what would we have to add to the tailings to get plants to grow? This strategy is called phytostabilization, meaning we want all of the metals in these tailings to stay in the rooting zone. We don't want them to go up into the plant tissue. Not, not here. All the metals should stay in the rooting zone. And that means that if you have animals come on the site, foraging animals or children playing, and they're exposed to the, to the shoot tissues, they won't be exposed to high level 
uh, high levels of, med, of lead or arsenic. So we wanted to evaluate suitable native plants, establish the minimum inputs necessary for plant growth and survival, um, look at succession, look at metal speciation, and look at dust emission from the site. Very quickly, some initial greenhouse studies showed that seven of the 15 native species we tried could survive in the tailings. And we found that 15% by weight of compost was needed to get good plant growth. And you can see it right here. This is buffalo grass with no compost, 10%, 15%, and 20%. And you'll see that buffalo grass, this one, and quail bush, this one, actually do very, very well in the field. So this is greenhouse. And then we initiated a field trial in May of 2010. This was all done by students and university workers. Um, they're all dressed in their, in their Tyvek suits with respirators to protect them. Um, this is normal windy day in the morning at the site. You can imagine what the town look, is, is like, the, the soils in the town. Um, so this is the plot. This is our, our test plot. And we have six different treatments, which I won't go into, um, in a random block design using uh, testing 10, 15, and 20% compost. And I just want to show you the results. Um, direct planting achieved a canopy cover that's similar to the surrounding area. So this is off-site vegetation, not affected by mine tailings. And this is our site after five months and here after 29 months. And this is the unamended uh, control. So we are very excited about this. But this is just the beginning of the research. Well, let me show this too. Um, we were quite excited after 17 months to see that the plants were actually quite healthy. They're blooming and seeding. And here's a couple other pictures. So this is right before the test in April. This is in September of 2011. And this is a great picture because you can see where the plants have been established. And you can see right across the street, this is the town. OK, so what are the other things that we have to think about? Um, we have to think about the impact of the phytostabilization process on the metals in the, in the soil, in the tailings, arsenic and lead in particular. So does phytostabilization make these materials more mobile, more bioaccessible? Or does phytostabilization um, make them less bioaccessible? Some initial studies show that on the root surface, you get plaque formation. This is a manganese plaque. And interestingly, associated with that manganese plaque is lead. I'm just, just showing you a little bit of data here, but this data is consistent with all of the data that we've seen that shows that both arsenic and lead are incorporated into more stable mineral forms during the phytostabilization process. We're very pleasantly surprised. We were not actually expecting that. We thought oxidation processes would mobilize them, but they're actually being incorporated into stable uh, metal forms. Characterizing dust emissions from the site. Um, we did a year of wind rose measurements, and you can see that the wind primarily comes from the northeast direction and blows right over the town. Um, we also collected the dust that was uh, coming off the site, and we collected it in size fractions. And you can see that these are the arsenic, lead, and cadmium in each of the size fractions, getting, going from small to bigger, bigger, bigger. These are the size fractions that are very tiny, and when you breathe them in, they go directly into your lung. 
These are the size fractions that hit the back of your throat and you, solo, you swallow them and they go into your stomach. And you can see that if you add all of the arsenic bars up, you're far above the arsenic um, regulatory limits in these small fractions. So the dust coming off these tailings is very high in metals. First of all, a plant canopy prevents the tailings on the ground from um, eroding by wind. So you prevent dust being emitted from where the plants are. But even more exciting are some results that show plants actually remove dust in the air that's moving over the planted sites. And so you can see that in the planted region, you're actually getting removal of the dust as it moves from one side of the plot to the other, which you don't get in the unplanted plots. Okay, So that's pretty cool. And in fact, the plants remove one to two pounds of dust per meter squared per year. That's really, really neat. So not only do they prevent the dust from being generated, but they're removing dust in the air as well. So in conclusion, um, assisted phytostabilization has the potential to be a cost-effective solution of direct planting into mine tailings. It seems to lower bioaccessibility of toxic metals. It seems to help um, um, remove dust from the site. There are still major information gaps for this technology. There's very little information that's long-term. We don't know how long these vegetative caps are viable. We don't know if there are normal plant successional processes. And we don't know how far those tailings will transition into having more soil-like properties, soil structure, a normal soil microbial community. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the research team. My research project um, was actually to do the phytostabilization, uh, but Eric Betterton, Eduardo Saez, and John Chorover were responsible for the metal speciation and the dust analysis. Um, and I'd like to, again, acknowledge our Superfund um, uh, research uh, funding. We're partners with EPA, with the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, and the site owner, Stephen Shookhart, has been wonderful to us. He, didn't, he, he bought this after it was there, um, but, but he's, he's really allowed us to come in and um, do what we need to do. If you'd like to follow pictures of the field study, um, here is the website, and it will be, it will be up on, on your website. So with that, I'd like to take any questions. Ես բոլոր ինչ նորակալություն եմ հայտնում այսօրվա սիմպոզիումի համար եւ ուզում եմ դիմեմ ձեզ արդյոք դուք գիտեք թե ինչ է կատարվում Հայաստանում այսօր բոլոր երկրները այստեղ ներկայացան իսկ Հայաստանի մասին մենք ոչ մի բան զեկոցում չլսեցին ես չգիտեմ այդում բաց թողում է մեզ մոտ շատ բաց էր կան որը պետք է անպայման դուք իմանայք այդ մասին նա հետ հիմա այստեղ մեզ մոտ նստած է մեր գլխավոր էկոլոգը Կարինե Դանիելյանը որը շատ լավ կարող է ներկայացնել ձեզ այսօրվա պատկերը հայաստանում բավականին պլաչևն է վատ վիճակում է գտնվում հայաստանը բացի այդ ուզում եմ ասեմ մի նոր բան կա որի մասին այսօր բոլորով ինչ խոցացին դա բան մեղուների հարցն է հիմա այդ բաները նոր մոբիլնի հերախոսները եւ ստանցիաները այնքան շատ են այստեղ եղել որ ամբողջ մեղուները վախճանվում են ուղակի մեզ մոտ մեղուների հարցը դրված է շատ վատ վիճակում ուղակի կատաստրոֆիկ այդ հարցը պետք է նայվ էր այստեղ ոչ մեկը այսօր դրա մասին չխոսած ես չգիտեմ ձեզ մոտ ինչ վիճակ է գտել բայց մեզ մոտ իրոք շատ վատ վիճակ է բացի այդ երեխաների մասին ուզում եմ ասեմ խոսեցին կանցեր կանցերի մասին եւ այդ հիվանդությունների բայց ոչ մեկը չբարձրացրեց աուտիզմի հարցը չէ որ հիմա աուտիզմը բավականին մեծ շատ մեծ տարածում ունի եւ ես կարծում եմ որ 
Esorva matnolor te yev ambochet ekalag ekalagichiski to bats to gumnere ihar ke dra hamare lender khagatse. Te yes aveli shad baner karoge masel bats uaki soge zamana ke dra hamar chemasun. Katnu menvor batsi kanceragen ni hivandu chunerits. Եվ սրտային հիվանդություններ կան եւ բան ինչ որ գլոբալ էր հարկավոր ինձ թվում այդ հարցը դնել ես ես ընդունում եմ եթե դուք ես տեղեք մի հատ գնացեք սոտ կնայեք տեսեք ինչ է կատարվում ոնց հասևանը փաստորեն շատ վատ վիճակում մեր ձկները այնտեղ վախճանվում են իսկ մեր գեոպրամանինգը որը այնտեղ աշխատանք է վարում ոչ մի բան դրամասին չի ասում եւ ոչ մի ոչ անբար ոչ մի բան մաքրություն չի արվում արվում է ամենավատ վիճակում է գտնվում եւ ժողովուրդը իրանք հանում են թափոնները թափում են դուրս ասում են որ հումքը մեզ այդ աթխոդի բանը ձեզ այսպեսի վիճակ է դրված հայաստանում ես կարծում եմ որ սա շատ լուրջ հարց պետք է դրվի այդ հարցում Ուղակի ասեմ որ հյուրերը գնալու են եւ տեսնելու են այդ վայրերը Well and, and I I think just having this having this meeting here um shows that Armenia is concerned about the problems it has. That's the purpose of this meeting. It's the first step. Uh Arthur Grigorian Iravaban Masnakitsam. Ինձ ստարկերը հետևյալ հարց է եւ հարց ուղում է ուղում են բոլոր զեկուցողներին Yelenov միջազգային դրական փորձից հայտնի արդյոք կամ համընդհանուր ճանաչում կա ինչ որ մի մեթոդաբանական ձեռնարկ որը որ հնարավորություն է ընձեռում շրջակա միջավայրի ախտոտվածության եւ մարդկանց առողջությանը պատճառված վնասի միջև գտնել ուղղակի պատճառահետևանքային կապկա արդյոք այդպեսի մի մեթոդաբանություն շնորհակալություն I I don't know of a manual that um provides information on exposures and health effects. I think it's probably dependent on what environment you're in. You you can't you can't just say um if this if A is if if this is here and that's there you know you have an answer because Armenia is different than Arizona. Um So no I I don't think that there is a manual available and correct me if I'm wrong anybody out there I was going to suggest as well that some of the uh IARC information that Kurt had discussed as well as um toxicological profiles that exist there's existing information it's not a manual form but it does have scientific evidence um discussing contaminants and health effects Ավելացնեմ որ մենք ներկայումս որոշ համաճարակաբանական ուսումնասիրություններ են կանում դեռ իրենք ավարտված չեն հույսով երբ որ վերջացնենք տվյալների մասին կտեղեկացնենք Ես ուզում եմ Դոկտոր Դանելյանին ներկայացնեմ Dr. Danelian is a member of the Hayastani Arachin, and he is a very active and very active activity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I am the Chairperson of the Association for Sustainable Human Development and the UNEP National Committee. Yes, շատ շնորհակալություն իրոք շատ կարևոր է այսպիսի գիտաժողովը հենց հայաստանում որովհետև մեզանում ամենա ահազանգող խնդիրն է այսօր ընդերք օկտագորտումը շրջակա միջավայրը եւ բնակչության առողջությունը բայց ես գտնում եմ որ մենք հետևանքներն ենք քննարկում հիմքը ինչպես որ մենք ենք տեսնում անցումային շրջանի երկրների համար հայաստանը կոնկրետ ինդուստրիալ երկիր է եւ նաեւ արդեն անցել է նույնիսկ հետո ինդուստրիալ փուլ անկախ շրջանում այս անցումային շրջանում համաշխարհային բանկի եւ միջազգային վալտային հիմնադրամի սխեմաներով մենք դարձանք հումքային կծորտ զարգացած երկրների համար դա պատահականություն չէ ես չեմ ուզում ասել որ դա նպատակն էր ռեֆորմների բայց արդյունքը դա է 
մենք կորցրեցինք մեր ամբողջ արցունավերությունը մնաց ընդերքը եւ հիմա մենք աֆրիկյան երկրների նման այս որ նկարագրում եք մենք էլ հիմա ինչ գնալով իջնում ենք այդ մակարդակի բացի դրանից ստեղծվեց այնպիսի օրենս դրություն որպեսի լավագույն պայմանները ստեղծվեն միջազգային կամպանիաների համար եկեք քանդեք տարեք շատ քիչ վճարեք բյուջե շրջակա միջավայրի մասին առհասարակ մի մտածեք բնակչության մասին մի մտածեք եւ մեր օլիգարխների մի մասը իրեն բաժին նունի են դեղից որոնք հենց ազգային ժողովում են որոնք հենց իշխանության մեջ են եւ երկիրը ուղակի մենք կորցնում ենք այսօր այսօր մենք ունենք արդեն 500 այս փոքր տարածքում 500 ուրեմն հանքավայր եւ ամեն տարի 30-ից 40 50 ավելանում են ընդվորում զգալի մասը մետաղային են որոնք ամբողջ ծանր մետաղներով ամբողջ շրջապատը քայքայում են հիմա այս պարագայում ընջոները կռվում են այո մաս մեդիան մեզ հետ միանում է բայց երբ սա գլոբալ համաշխարային խնդիր է այդ իրավիճակից հումքային կծորտ լինելու իրավիճակից ինչպես կարող ենք դուրս գալ դուք տեսնում եք այդ ճանապարը առանձին առանձին քայլեր կարող ենք անել բայց գլոբալ խնդիր է շնորհակալություն Thank you for that comment and I, we should move on and and I think it's a nice transition in a way because our next speaker has not all the solutions but one step I think that could help uh in Armenia and 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 certainly is helping in a number of other countries around the world. Uh this is Drew McCarter who's uh with the Blacksmith Institute and by way of full ex- disclosure I should say that I'm on the uh technical advisory board for uh the Blacksmith Institute. Uh, but Drew today is going to talk about to talk to us about heavy metal hot spots for mining or processing and smelting in the former Soviet Union. <clears throat> Drew is the regional program director for the International Environmental Health Organization uh, Blacksmith Institute. Uh Drew leads the organization's efforts to identify and mitigate environmental health risks from industrial pollution in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and the Philippines. Uh he manages the uh, global toxic sites and identification program in the former Soviet republics and i think you'll hear about that today and uh uh in uh i think i'm going to stop there he's he's uh uh his degrees in economics and uh, international environmental law thanks if i could just have a hand getting a different powerpoint up i'm have lost my familiarity with pcs I'm a full Mac convert now. I recognize I'm the last person standing between you and your dinner, so I'll try and be brief here. Great, thank you. Um I'd like to start by just thanking our organizers for this opportunity. Uh it's a great privilege to be here. It's my second time in Armenia and I'm very happy to be back. I work for this organization called Blacksmith Institute. It's a US nonprofit organization and it does basically two things. It identifies and screens toxic hot spots in low and middle income countries and it organizes remediation or intervention projects to try and reduce environmental health risks. Today I'll talk mostly about screening, um uh, but then right at the end we'll talk about how we try and transition screening into project work. Earlier today Dr. Petrosian shared some data from a site screening program here in Armenia and that data and that program is part of a global program that Blacksmith Institute manages in 65 countries today. Um this program is about 4 years old. It's funded by the World Bank, the European Commission, the evil World Bank, and uh the Asian Development Bank. Um and those funders will be important at the end of this when we talk about trying to transition screening 
into remediation. Uh, because it's these funders that are really interested in developing this inventory of toxic hotspots because they believe that this problem is bigger than they understand today. And they're funding this program to try and get an idea of just the scope, the magnitude of this issue. Um, so the scope of this project is fairly limited. We're looking for toxic hotspots, so that's heavy metals, radionuclides, POPs, dioxins, PAHs. Um, we're looking for point source pollution, so this is not about distributed air pollution. We're only working in low and middle income countries, countries that need a little extra assistance to address this issue. Um, and we're only looking at human health. This is not really an environmental program. The medium that we work in is the environment, but this is really a human health aimed project. Um, and the goals are to increase public awareness, to increase funding to address this problem, um, and to prioritize resources towards those sites that present the most dramatic human health risks. So here you can see where we've been working. This map is outdated because Armenia is not filled in here. Um, but today we've expanded to 65 countries. And what we're doing is we're building a global database. All of the data that we gathered is stored online. And we use that database to compare sites, to understand trends, um, and to prioritize our response. Um, just like AUA and uh, Dr. Petrosian and Dr. Ahbabian are leading this program in Armenia, um, 64 other organizations are leading it in other countries, and each one of them hires and trains a team of investigators that scours their country and conducts rapid site screenings. And it's important to point out that what we're doing is a little bit different than the type of risk assessment um, that Susan described, um, because this is really, our screening happens right before that. This is an effort to identify sites that probably present a serious risk and that need the type of detailed assessment that you would do before a remediation project. So this is a, a, a much kind of cheaper and faster um, identification program. Um, over those two days of a screening, the investigators will take photos, conduct interviews, um, and conduct uh, some limited environmental sampling, um, both composite sampling and targeted sampling. Um, but it's very fast, and we spend about $500 to $1,000 doing this. And the goal is just to get a sense of how risky the site could be and whether it should be prioritized for more detailed assessment. So here's a map of all of the sites that we've identified throughout the world. Um, we've identified over 2,800, and we've completed 1,830 screenings. Um, so let's talk about how we compare risks between sites, because as I said, the purpose here is to direct resources toward those sites that present the most dramatic risk. And to do that, we need to try to compare apples to apples here, uh, which is difficult because we're talking about sites in different countries uh, that have different pollutants and different geographies and different cultural traditions, which makes it difficult to compare them. And the way that we do it is uh, by assigning them a relative risk score between 0 and 10 using an algorithm called the Blacksmith Index, which is a simplified version of this source pathway receptor model that is the basis of many nations' um, programs like Superfund. Uh, we've simplified that process to make it a little easier and cheaper. Um, but basically, it uses a couple of points of data to assign this score. And those are the concentration of the pollutant, the estimated population that could come into contact with that pollutant, and then in some cases a persistence factor, um, how long the pollutant will exist in the environment and continue to pose a risk. So let's talk very briefly about those different points of data. 
Estimating the population at risk, we do this by dividing a site into different sectors by the use of the area. And then we take samples in those sectors and we try and estimate the population that lives, works, or moves through that sector. So let's take a look at an example here. Here we have a site. In the center, we have a pollution source. We have two residential communities and one agricultural area and then an area that's not used. In this example, we would divide the site into four sectors, conduct sampling in each, estimate the population in each, um, so we have a sense of how many people are coming into the contamination in sector four, how many people might be impacted by the contamination in sector three, and so on. Uh, the other piece of data that goes into this is the severity, which is really just um, how much above maximum recommended levels or action levels is the contamination in a site. And here we faced a problem where we had to decide whether to use local standards or one uniform standard. Um, when we talk with country officials, uh, representatives of governments about this program, they often say, we have our own standards, you should use those. Obviously, if you're working in our country, you should be um, equating your work to our standards, um, which is a very valid point but that prevents us from being able to compare sites between countries, which is uh, one of the ultimate goals here. And so we decided that we had to use a uniform standard. Um, and so we then had to decide how to choose the levels that we would use. And just very briefly, um, here's how we do it. When available, we use WHO standards. Um, those are available for water, but not soil. And so when they're not available, we go to tier two sources and we start with the US EPA. And that's because the US EPA's system is the system that is most often used to create other countries' systems, meaning it is one of the most widely accepted. Um, in certain instances, the US EPA's standards are an outlier. Other countries disagree. Um, very dramatically with the US standards and in that case we have a technical advisory board that would decide whether we need to use um, a more consensus figure, a figure from another system um, that, that provides more consensus. Um, but I'm not going to go into great detail because of course we're pressed for time. So what can we do with this information? Here are all of the sites we saw earlier divided by the pollutants that we found, the key pollutant, meaning the pollutant that was the most above the standards. And you can see some trends here. In Southeast Asia, for example, we have these light blue dots, and those all represent mercury. Southeast Asia has a lot of artisanal, small-scale gold mining, and those miners use mercury to separate gold from soil, and throughout Southeast Asia we find a lot of mercury. In India, you'll see blue dots. That represents chromium, primarily from leather tanning. In the former Soviet Union, unfortunately, we see a lot of purple dots. That's radionuclides, often from uranium mining. Um, and then kind of the rest of the world is a more mixed bag. OK, so let's look at some global data. What, what can we see from this? Um, the first thing that jumps out is that lead is the biggest pollutant that we've found in the 1,800 sites that we've screened. Um, and because I'm supposed to be talking about mining, I divided mining out from the rest of sources. And you can see that over 3 million people are estimated to be living in areas where we found lead over the uh, recommended maximum level. And you'll see there's a huge disparity between the uh, mining lead population and the total lead population from all sources. And that is because I did not include battery recycling in that mining figure. The difference between those numbers is almost entirely batteries. Um, and then you can see that mercury is the next most prevalent pollutant and it starts to drop off significantly after that. Okay, let's look at some regional data. Um, for the former Soviet Union, which is the area that I work in and that you might be most interested in, uh, we've been working for four years in Russia and Ukraine, 
and one year in Armenia, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan. One year allows us to do generally 30 to 50 screenings, and we're going to continue screening in all of these countries and expand to a couple of new countries this year. So what have we found? Um, in the former Soviet Union, as in the rest of the world, lead is a huge problem. You can see red, uh, lead represented here uh, in the red dots. And you can see in Armenia, oh, first I'd like to apologize for this map. Uh, the borders may be drawn incorrectly, and I promise that is not a political statement that I'm making. <laughs> it's just the map that I found. <laughs> so here's the same map with the dots showing the estimated population at risk from each of those sites. These dots don't show the spread of the pollution. They just represent how many people might come into contact with high levels of pollutants in each site. The larger dots here generally are large lead smelters. Oh, OK. So for example, you can see one large dot in southern Kazakhstan there. That's a large lead smelter in the town of Shimkent, which is kind of a famous, terrible lead site. And in the lower box, you can see all the work that Karin and Varduhi have been doing in the last year. OK, so just like the rest of the world, lead is the leading pollutant that we've found in the former Soviet Union. Um, I should say that this is preliminary data, um, so it could change as we do more assessments. Um, but we expect this trend to continue. Um, and overall, from mining and ore processing and primary smelting, we've found 2.3 million people living in areas where we have found contamination over recommended maximums and 5.4 million from all sources. We can also break this data down into country levels. So here's a map of Armenia. I hope this one is right, but I'm not sure. Um, and you can see here all of the sites that Varduhi and Karin's team have visited in the last year, um, separated by pollutant. So our key findings here. Um, lead, as you've heard over and over again today, is a big problem. It's a big problem with the world around and again here. Um, most of the sources that we find are old and abandoned. Uh, in Armenia, it might be different, but in the rest of the world, we've had a surprising conclusion, which is that we often like to think or have a preconceived notion that it's these Fortune 500 multinational companies that are polluting the earth. And what we've found is that globally, it's actually been the opposite. Very often, it's small-scale, unregulated backyard industries or very old government-run industries um, or kind of small-scale industries that are causing these local contamination problems just because they don't have the modern technologies and they're done in hiding um, because they're often illegal that um, are creating the problems that we're finding, which was surprising to all of us. We find that public awareness is really low and that governments are often either unaware or unwilling to acknowledge this problem. So you have data, but what really matters is what you do with it. Um, so here's what we do with ours. At the global level, we give this data to decision makers from donor agencies. Um, as I said, it was important to say who funded this project because they want the data back because they all know in the back of their mind that this problem needs a lot more funding. And they just needed the data to prove it so that they can ha justify spending more money on this. So that's what we're doing. We're proving it and we're giving the data back to them so they can open up the faucet and spend a little more money on remediation. At the country level, we give all of our data to the relevant government uh, ministries. Um, and we hope to work with each country's government to develop a national strategy to address this issue, to prioritize sites, and to come up with funding strategies. Um, and this is also an initiative, these national strategies, that the donors have requested. They said, we would like to give more money to this issue, but we need to see a scientifically based plan, about a plan of attack. So we hope to develop that um, here in Armenia. And then at the project level, Blacksmith Institute uses this data to 
pr uh, prioritize sites for projects that are funded and managed directly by Blacksmith. Next step. Obviously, our number one goal is to reduce health risks. So in 2013, Blacksmith Institute and AUA are going to continue to screen sites to do more detailed assessments. Uh, we're working to identify one site in Armenia where we can begin a pilot remediation program this year. Um, and we are meeting very soon, in fact, with the relevant ministries in Armenia to discuss how to uh, how, how Blacksmith can be a tool, how this database can be a tool um, to increase funding for them, to help them strategize and prioritize response and achieve their own goals, um, which will probably involve uh, helping them create a priority list, a plan of action, and some options for funding. So that's it. Thank you. Some questions? Thanks for your talk, Peter Bingham from Vermont. As a pediatric neurologist, I'm certainly sensitive to the and sympathetic to the idea of uh, prioritizing lead, knowing the behavior problems and cognitive uh, impairment that results from lead. But I wonder how you can know that lead is the major uh, pollution issue, uh, how much have we measured organic compounds, for example, what you don't measure, you cannot relatively prioritize to lead. I noticed that the index doesn't really take into account the burden of pathology. It's, it's more of a kinetic kind of a model. So I wonder about that too. Sure. It's a, it's a great point. Um, let me divide it into two. Uh, regarding you can't uh, measure what you don't kind of screen for. Um, it's true. In each country, the staff that conducts this will have their own biases and, inf and, and limits of information that lead them towards certain sites. Um, if, if the local media has published pesticide dumps as the major problem in the country, they might go after pesticide dumps and ignore mines, for example. Um, and we're cognizant of that, and that's why I, I always make sure to say that this is very preliminary. It's, it's what we've found. It's not necessarily representative exactly of what exists. Um, and then regarding your second point, um, in terms of the kind of measuring, uh, taking into account the epidemiological issues, we, that is all done within the screening levels that we choose. I think that it's all factored in to setting those screening levels, that work being done by the EPA and others like it. So thankfully, we don't have to do that. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, I understand that it's sort of per pollutant. Yes. So that it sort of normalizes the pathology burden implied, I think, if yeah. I understand. Yeah. Thanks. Next question. Just following up on this, I mean, this is a great and most important project, and uh, I think this is most useful. Uh, and all the kind of small comment I have is really on a detailed technical level. Um, because if you use exposure limits as, uh, and the exceeding of the exposure limit to, as one of your major uh, scores for the overall blacksmith score, you do not take into account how relevant the cancers are, for example, or the disease outcomes. So, for example, all of this has been tried again recently in the Global Burden of Disease Project, where we, only, where we looked at the relative risks associated with certain exposure levels, where we looked at the, how frequent the cancers are. Uh, now, this then in the end gives you a burden. Here, if you have one certain exposure level that is exceeded by tenfold, it may be neurocognitive disease in children, which is most important in terms of DALI's uh, disabled adjusted life years, etc. In, in another instance, it may be five or several cancer sites uh, with premature mortality. So you're really comparing apple and oranges, even if you use uh, similar standards from US EPA, which is probably a good approach. It's for refinement. <laughs> I would only Kurt say Strafe, uh, thank you, Kurt Strafe, IARC. Go ahead, Andrew. I would only say that um, 
you know, we would like to include more, more data, uh, more detailed assessment and all of this, but, you know, just with the funding and the resources we have, you know, these are really $1,000 screenings here. Um, but certainly all of that consideration would be relevant when, you, uh, when we identify a site that really is prioritized for further assessment. Um, that would all be very relevant. Next question. Uh, it's not a question. I would like to make a comment, but if you don't mind, I will make the comment in Armenian, and hopefully it will be translated. Yes, Uraki Uzume Mir Kuhoskov, I serve a masin asset. Carnivor has done American Hamaser and a basmative Napatak Nerits make, and I have Hamarumets Arayel, Ish Ureman Hamain Knerin. Ye Vorpes Aitz Arachan Mas. Մենք փորձեցինք սկսել գիտական սեմինարների սիմպոզիումների շարք սկսած նոյեմբեր ամսվանից, որը անդրադառնում էր այս հարցին, որը շատ կարևոր է մեր քաղաքացիների համար։ Եվ նաև մենք փորձեցինք սկսել գիտական ծրագրեր, որոնք հնարավորություն կտան փաստեր ունենալու մեր իրավիճակի մասին, իրական իրավիճակի մասին։ Եվ շատ շնորհակալ ենք Բլեք Սմիթ Ինստիտուտին, որ հնարավորություն տվեց այդ փոքրիկ պրոյեկտը իրական անցնելու, որը հույսով կունենա շարունակություն։ Եվ այսօրվա նպատակներից մեկներ կիսվել ձեզ հետ առաջին անգամ ընդհանուր տեղեկատվությունով։ Հաջորդ նպատակը մենք ունենք այսպեսի հնարավորություն հրավիրելու միջազգային շատ հայտնի էքսպերտների, որոնք աշխատում են այս ասպարեզում եւ աշխատողների եւ համայնքների առողջության, որպիսի իրենք կիսվեին իրենց համաշխարային փորձով մեզ հետ։ Մենք ունենք տարբեր մասնակիցներ եւ կառավարական սեկտորից եւ ոչ կառավարական սեկտորից եւ ունենք ուղղակի քաղաքացիներ եւ Երևանից եւ Մարզերից, որը շատ հաճելի էր։ Dr. Daniela has said that the government has been working on the strategy of the government. We have been working on the strategy of the government. We have been working on the government. We have been working on the government. We have been working on the government. We have been working Zarayel մեր հանրությանը եւ փորձել այլ գիտերիքները բերել, փաստերը բերել եւ հասցնել մեր քաղաքացիներին։ Շնորհակալություն, ես շնորհակալություն եմ հայտնում այսօրվա բոլոր մասնակիցներից, ներկայացնողներից եւ նաեւ մեր մասնակիցներից, ովքեր դահլիճում նստած էին, ներողություն եմ խնդրում, որ ժամանակի պատճառով չկարողացանք հնարավորություն տալ շատերին հարցեր տալ, ովքեր ունեին հարցեր, սահմանափակեցին հարցերի քանակը դե գիտեք միջոցառումների ժամանակ նաև թերություններ են լինում ամեն ինչ չի որ հրաշալի անցնում բայց հուսով եմ որ այն նպատակները որ մենք մեր առաջ դրել ենք որոշակի առումով կարողացանք իրականացնել եւ մեծ հաճույքով սпасում ենք նաև ձեզ բոլորիդ վաղը ժամը 1 դա կլինի նվիրված արդեն շինարարության մեջ աշխատողների եւ շինարարության հետ կապված առողջական ռիսկերի վերաբերյալ շնորհակալություն thank you for do we oh can i say one more thing i am around the entire week and i would be happy to discuss anything and so is margaret and I believe these other folks, if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to uh, discuss that with you at another time.